I'll uh, let him maybe introduce himself and talk about uh, what, what he's going to talk about. It's AI in there. Thanks, Ariel. Um, hi, friends. Um, so we, we have we have a, an hour, and uh, and we have lots of crazy stuff to talk about, which uh, which is uh, somewhat ill prepared and patchwork on my part. Uh, I have a lot to say on this topic, and it's an area that we've been doing a lot of thinking about uh, in uh, in my team at, at Google and uh, and more broadly. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about why that is as well. And it's an area that's in very, very rapid development, I think, in some pretty interesting ways, which I think will become clear in the, in the sort of uh, royal of everything, that, of everything that I will show you. I should say something about who, about who I am. So um, I, um, I'm, I'm not really an academic. Uh, I'm not really a computer scientist either. Um, I, uh, my background is actually in physics uh, and computational neuroscience. Uh, my wife is actually a computational neuroscientist here at UW, Adrienne Fairhall. Uh, so she uh, she runs a, a lab here uh, that you know works on works on brains. We we met at a course called Methods in Computational Neuroscience uh, on the East Coast in in, in um, Woods Hole, and. Um, Whereas she took the sort of natural sciences direction, uh, I took the 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 more computery direction and uh, the more engineering oriented as opposed to science oriented uh, kind of path, and ended up um, uh, running some well first starting a startup and then running some teams at Microsoft that worked on machine perception uh, and mapping and augmented reality and other things like that, and uh, and now run a, a fairly large organization at Google. It's it's about 500 people now. Uh, who mostly work on various forms of applied AI um, and uh, and some some theoretical work as well. Uh, it's uh, it's a team that doesn't really have a name externally. Uh, you know, people always say, "Oh, so you're you're you know, like you're part of the Google Brain team." Uh, internally, our name is Cerebra, which is the plural of brain, and uh, and that was a kind of time, a sort of deliberate choice when I came to Google to start a team with that name uh, about five years ago. The Brain team was nascent; it already existed though, and my view was that we were not after making just a single brain in the sky that would connect to everybody, but rather uh, I, I wanted to see if we could make brains in the plural that, uh, that would be highly personal and that would not equal Google. Uh, this was a, a bit of a weird thing to go to Google to do because you know, Google is, is the company that I, I think is the furthest ahead in, in, um, uh, in doing uh, the sort of engineering of neural nets for various reasons, one of which is that neural nets and machine learning are extremely data hungry. So it's not a coincidence that the companies that have the biggest access to data are, uh, are among the ones that are furthest ahead in that field. And Google kind of invented the entire uh, services culture in which you, know, you, you deliver a product not by making something that you sell to people, but by making a service that everybody plugs into and uses. And uh, you know, although, although Larry and Sergey certainly didn't know this in the, uh, in the 90s, um, that turned out to be the ideal platform from which to, uh, to, to build really fancy neural nets that are very data hungry, because now you have a service that tons of, of personal data are flowing through. And you can then use that as the fuel to, to, build, uh, to build neural nets. And Google does, you know, release a lot of data sets, and you know they try to be, you know, a good part of the community of, of machine learning. But there's an inherent tension between uh, between being good stewards of, of that data and providing open access to the machine learning community as well. And you know that's 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 a tension that that, that I've I've seen kind of navigated internally a number of times. Um, so. Google tries to, to do a, you know to do a good job with all of this kind of stuff and 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 they they have you know often very difficult choices to make um, but they, they also you know are operating in sort of a different world than they were when they began when when you make um, a product that is kind of like the library of Alexandria you know that, that, that indexes and catalogs all of the world's public information and makes that available for everybody at a website the idea of doing that centrally using a using a data center makes a lot of sense but as, as that product starts to become something that is more and more like a neuroprosthetic, which is to say something that is not just a resource, not just a library that you go to, but something that is in intimate contact with you throughout your daily experience, um, that starts to look less and less like a problem that's well suited to, uh, to a kind of services framework and something that is more suited to a, to a prosthesis. You know, the, uh, when, again, when Google began, uh, you know, the, the laptop was still you know, somewhat of a, <laughs> of a novelty in some sense. I mean, most people went to their computer. Now the computer is a part of your body. 
uh, and, uh, and, and you take it with you everywhere. It's the phone, of course, that I'm talking about, although we're, you know, we're reaching a period of post phones as well. And, um, and, and they, they augment your capabilities as a person. So you know, what, what do you want? Do you want for that to be the extension of a company that is embedded in your body? Uh, that starts to look a little bit like your Borg. Uh, which incidentally is the name of one of the Google systems that, that, that manages uh, large-scale server, you know, sort of deployment of, of computational resources inside. Uh, or do you want to be more like an X-Man, that, uh, you know, a, a person who is superhuman rather than subhuman, because you are augmented with computational capabilities that are sort of like a, an extension of your, your body and brain. Um, the difference is, uh, in, in large part, where the computations are taking place and whether the data belong to you or, or to the company. And so what, what, you know, what, what I wanted to do at, at Google was to sort of push the X-Men, not Borg, uh, kind of uh, narrative. And, uh, and so a lot of what we've focused on in practice has been building neural nets that, that are fast enough and lightweight enough to run on devices locally so that the data doesn't have to go to the server and then back. And also uh, building techniques, uh, and the, the one that I'm, that I'm proudest of uh, is, is federated learning, that allow for the entire learning loop to happen in a decentralized way, such that, uh, such that the data don't have to come back in order for, for uh, learning to happen in an aggregated fashion. That, that, um, so the way I've sometimes described federated learning to sort of lay audiences is that it's sort of like, you know, we're building robots rather than Google being a giant robot, but we also have made a kind of robot conference so that the robots can all get together and share best practices, but in the same way that doctors do uh, when, they, when they get together, maintaining patient-doctor confidentiality in such a way that the, the, the data from, from users never uh, is, is never observed by Google, can't be observed by Google, can't be observed by anybody surveilling the network, which is uh, also increasingly important. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not actually that concerned, uh, to be honest, about, about Google being the bad actor with respect to people's personal data. They're, they're extremely uptight about this to the point where, I, where you know, the, the, the very common complaint among machine learning researchers inside is that they cannot get access to data. It's very different from the perception from the outside, I know. Um, but I'm, I'm more concerned with the fact that, that when Google serves uh, these services in various countries, they're subject to the laws of those countries uh, that, that require that, that access to those data be made available to uh, whatever agencies might apply. Uh, in, in, in that place, including in the U.S. And um, I really don't want us to be party to the violation of people's uh, civil liberties. I don't want that possibility to be there for the future. And, um, and not just civil liberties, but, but ultimately human rights and, and other kinds of things. You know, we want to build systems that are robust to however things evolve in the future and, and the, the variety of different conditions that, that, are, that are experienced all over the world. So that's, that's kind of what I do in my day job. And, and, and that'll maybe hint at some of the connections with ethics and also some of the connections between, um, between AI and neuroscience that I, that I see. I mean, there are many. Um, the, the history of AI and neuroscience, or computers and neuroscience, uh, are, is, is deeply entangled. I don't think that most people understand that. When neuroscience and computer science began, they were the same field. It was the same pioneers. And the, the original idea of computers was to build an artificial brain. So the idea of AI was inherent in, in, uh, in the, the birth of computing. Those things diverged. Uh, in the 40s for, for various reasons. And the history lesson is actually really interesting and fun, but that we probably don't have time for that today. Um, and, and the really interesting thing now is that I think that those fields are reconverging because you know, now we start to have this sort of renaissance of techniques that, uh, that, that involve not so much coding, but learning. And, um, and, and making neural nets that, that learn rather than executing a fixed series of operations. And, uh, and surprise, surprise, the ones that can actually do things that, that are brain-like, perception, motor control, judgment, and so on, look a lot like the architectures of brains. The, the really, I mean, Adrian and I have this, you know, uh, have this kind of disagreement sometimes, how much do artificial neural nets actually look like biological neural nets? It's, they don't, of course, there's a, there's a difference. But um, there are many differences. But the fact that, they, that they, they, we call them neurons and synapses and that they're organized more or less in that way and that they have layers and so on, I don't think is a coincidence that we, that, that, that we have those architectures now. They're starting to make that brain-like progress. And, uh, and so the more you start to think about those as parts of, as parts of devices and, and um, prosthetics, the more that boundary is blurring, not only in theory, but also in practice between, uh, between neuroscience and computer science today. Um, and just to put it, maybe a bit of an exclamation point on that, the, the, chip, the way chips have been designed for the last 70 years, uh, or I guess it's more like 50, 
has been oriented towards serial computing of the kind that Turing and von Neumann invented uh, with, with, their, with their collaborators in, in the 40s. And, um, and that's, you know, that's a separate sort of memory and processor that executes instructions and, and does things in, in series. It's well suited to being programmed. That's a very poor architecture uh, for, for evaluating neural nets because neural nets involve having to do lots and lots of computations in parallel and, and essentially joining memory and computation together so that you, know, you have lots of simple operations happening at the same time. When you build silicon to do that, you can do it at much higher throughput than trying to simulate that on a serial processor. And you can do it at much lower power. That low power is extremely important because that's the way you can actually make those things uh, uh, sort of uh, cost effective and battery effective in such a way that they can become prosthetics. We have encountered a period uh, you know, in which the, the sort of engine that's driven a lot of tech, Moore's Law, uh, for the past many decades, has run out of steam along the path of increasing the clock speed of serial computing. This is the, the end of Dennard scaling, for, the, for those of you who follow things like this. You know, when I was a, when I was a you know, young person uh, kind of hacking in my basement, people still talked about how many gigahertz their machine ran. You know, that was the sort of measure of performance of your, of your machine. Nobody talks about that anymore because your watch and your phone and your, and your desktop, uh, should you have one, all run at the same gigahertz roughly. Uh, we've reached the end of that sort of scaling. And when that happened, roughly in 2006, that's when all of the chip makers began putting more and more cores onto every, onto every chip because you know, when you run out of the ability to, to upclock, you, you say, well, okay, transistors are still getting smaller, so how can I fit more computation on the chip? Well, let's do it by putting more cores on. There's a limit to that, too, if you're doing serial computing, because once you have a separate processor for everything that is going on in your phone, for the foreground process and the background process and location services and whatever else, then you're, you're sort of, you're done. Well, neural computing provides the answer, because uh, if you start to build the chip in a way that is executing entire neural nets in parallel, then you have an endless appetite for transistors and you can keep shrinking them and you can keep running them at the speeds that they're running now or even at much slower speeds. I mean, our, our brains run at 10 kilohertz um, and, uh, and, and you can still get huge increases in computation. And so if you think about all of that together, you realize that over the next 10 years, the use of silicon in our personal devices is going to be overwhelmingly tipping in the direction of neural computing uh, as opposed to conventional computing to the point where, by my guess, in 10 years time, 99% of the silicon in personal device is going to be neural as opposed to Turing von Neumann. So, you know, in a very real sense, these devices are becoming neural prosthetics. Um, so so let's, uh, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about, about ethics and about why, um, why ethicists are annoying. So uh, if you've ever touched on the subject of, of, um, of ethics in neuroscience, uh, then the first thing that probably came up is deep brain stimulation and uh, the ethical problems of deep brain stimulation. Uh, I, I was frustrated by this for, for, for many years and puzzled by it. Why is this a deep brain stimulation thing? Why is that all we're talking about? You, you plug deep brain stimulation ethics into Google and you get millions of search results and you know, all of the, the, you know, this has kind of dominated the, the, the discussion. Well, the, the reason is because when we talk about ethics in science generally, um, you know, first of all, we tend to only be concerned with humans. And uh, that concern with humans is maybe understandable. You know, most of us uh, eat meat. Most of us don't necessarily think about all kinds of larger constructs in ethical terms. We think about, about life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and so on. So it's about the person. Uh, it's about the individual human. And, and, um, and as far as human experimental neuroscience is concerned, our tools are very crude. The only thing that we, uh, the only things that we're able to do, uh, that that are that are sort of interfering in a meaningful way with the activity of the brain, are things like cutting it in half, or taking out big chunks for epilepsy treatments, or doing stimulation, and again in a very coarse way, just electrodes implanted somewhere deep in the brain, and stimulating one of the one of these centers deep in the brain that is you know producing some kind of chemical that's that's pervading the entire thing, and um, and it it confronts us even that very that very crude tool, maybe especially because it's so crude, it confronts us with the realities of computational neuroscience in a, in a way that is very spooky. Um, again, I, you know, going really into the deep brain stimulation story in detail here is something that we don't have time for, but if you, if, you, if you look on YouTube, you can find videos of people getting stimulated and their entire affect and personality changing as a result 
Uh, it's also tremendously valuable therapeutically for people who have Parkinson's, uh, for people who uh, it's, it's you know, experimentally also being used for obsessive compulsive disorder, for depression. There are some podcasts that, uh, that have talked about this that I, that I think are very compelling uh, and worth a listen. Um, I think Invisibilia did one, uh, maybe Radiolab did one. Um, so, you know, it just kind of confronts you with the fact that your brain is this thing, is this piece of machinery, and that when you monkey with it, uh, when you, you know, plug in current, stuff changes. You, you can't sort of have the illusion anymore that you're some kind of a disembodied soul that is not uh, sort of generated by, uh, if you like, or connected to the physical embodiment of, of the brain. And these perturbations that have obvious therapeutic value uh, change your own state, change your wants, your needs, your responses. So that, that, that seems like it's, uh, like it's very troubling from the point of view of thinking about what should be. Because whenever we talk about what, about what should be, about ethical stuff, uh, you know, we're using as some kind of a compass people's own wants and wishes and desires. And so if those things are not something that you can kind of rely on as being stable, Right, but are affected by the intervention that you're doing, then suddenly you realize you're in general relativity rather than special relativity. Right? What I mean is that the frame of reference changes as you, as you, uh, as you, do, th as you do stuff. So now, where is north? What is good? Uh, right? When good can change as you, uh, you know, for, the, for that person as you, as you intervene. So that's one of the reasons that, that deep brain stimulation raised all of these points. Um, the fact that it's a medical procedure also meant that that framework of ethics was close at hand. And that's because of the Belmont Report. How, how many of you uh, know about the Belmont Report and the Tuskegee study? Uh, okay, how many of you don't know about this? All right, enough that it's worth saying. So um, briefly, this was a study that began, uh, I think, in the 30s and went on for 40 years and involved um, uh, black Americans in the South uh, and, uh, and systematically not treating them for syphilis in order to see what would happen. So uh, it was done without their consent, uh, of course. Uh, when it began, penicillin was not yet the, uh, the sort of uh, the, the treatment of choice necessarily. So there were perhaps legitimate questions about, um, about what, you know, how, how to treat syphilis or, or what the course of the disease is. But by the end, of course, uh, you know, everybody knew exactly how to treat syphilis, and, and you know, long before the study concluded, everybody knew that this was the treatment that it cured people, that it worked, and somehow this study kept going on and on and on and on with devastating results for for that for the community uh, under treatment, hundreds of black men in the South, and um, and the fact that they were black uh, is obviously salient here, um, you know, for multiple reasons. Uh, first, because I, I doubt that this would have happened uh, if they had not been. Uh, and this was the period of, of, of the civil rights movement. Uh, you know, this kind of happened from, <laughs> from pre-civil rights to post-civil rights and sort of spanned that, that period. Um, and uh, and it, it raised all kinds of very interesting questions about not only uh, individual welfare and well-being, but also about communities and, about, uh, and about, about what happens when these things intersect with identity uh, and, with, uh, and, and with historic oppression. So uh, devastating, and uh, and this and, and when this all finally came to light, um, you know, you know and these are this is this is recent history. Like this was this was happening in the 70s when it all came to light, and the and the uh, and the Belmont report got put together. That resulted in institutional review boards and processes for um, for medical interventions to get reviewed from an ethics standpoint, so that this kind of shit would never happen again, uh, in theory. And um, and so you know when 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 things like deep brain stimulation comes, well, it, it, you know, it comes in the framework of, of, uh, of, the, of the Belmont Report. It's a medical procedure. There is a framework for, for looking at this stuff. And so we know who to call in. Let's call in the ethicists. That focus on, 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 um, on making it all medical uh, is probably an issue in various ways that I hope will become clear. Um, the, the ethical frameworks are problematic in other ways as well, um, also in ways that I hope will become clear. And so a lot of the times now, you know, when, when, we, when we have conversations about AI or neuroscience and people are like, you know, we should get some ethicists in here to talk about this, we see a pretty interesting culture clash happen. Who are ethicists? Most of them uh, come from a, a sort of liberal arts tradition. Uh, they come from fields like philosophy, anthropology, and, um, and, they, and, and they, 
they have a, a very, very different sort of, of, um, of prior on the kinds of activity that they pursue professionally than I suspect most of us do in this room. We are oriented toward action. We're oriented toward making things. Analyze the data, understand what it is, publish. Make something new, uh, you know, show that it exceeds some, th some previous thing. Put it in a table, publish. Um, or even, you know, find a, uh, find a diagnosis, uh, find, a, find the symptoms of a new disease, uh, you know, find a procedure that, that, that works, that helps, publish. In all of these cases, there is an axis of good and bad, right? There's a better and a worse thing. We make a plot, you know, the, going north on the plot is generally good, unless you're doing loss functions, in which case you want to minimize it, right? But there's always a compass. We know what's good and what's bad. You work on it, you publish, you do, you go forward. So there's a very, very clear sense of, of, of progress. In the humanities, there is not such a clear sense of progress. The humanities is, uh, these days, largely about critique. It's about discussion. It's about theory. Uh, and those, those things, um, you know, kind of, uh, there, there's, almost, there's almost a revulsion against the idea that there is, a, that there is such a thing as, as, as a right way to go, you know, progress. You know, you say, well, there's, this is the right answer. Uh, you know, a humanist will say, well, well, how do you know that that's the right answer? How do you know that that's the right direction? Can we go and question that and criticize it? Is there some way in which what you're saying is wrong? And they're often very loath to, you know, to, um, to sort of build on, on results and, and, and move forward, and, and a lot more of it is about applying breaks and applying critique. This is a big problem, uh, in my view, because you know, we, we, have, we have two cultures, one of which is obsessed with, with, uh, with moving forward but, but doesn't question enough the direction in which the forward movement is happening. And we have another culture that, uh, that has been so alienated over the past few decades with the idea of moving forward that they don't, that they don't have a sense of which way is up. And everything is about, uh, about sort of questioning and about, about, about you know, deciding on which direction we're looking and about, uh, and about, about processing uh, as opposed to action. And neither of these alone is going to work. And the ways in which the discussion happens between those two cultures uh, often reveal a lot of those pathologies. If you've ever been on panels that you know, bring on ethicists, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, lots of talk and writing, no answers or action, except maybe more process. We need to talk about this more. We need to convene another conference to have another discussion about this. We need to put in more process to make sure that X, Y, and Z you know, are considered. Right? And that's how it goes. Um, so cultural differences. And then there is the third kind of frustration, uh, ideology and culture wars. Uh, there's actually an example that I just saw um, a couple of days ago, July 29th, to the, uh, 2019. So this is, this, is, uh, this is highly topical. When ethics review becomes ideological review, the case of Peter Bogosian, this was published in the, in the Quillette. Um, it's, uh, it's bound to be uh, controversial if we go into the details, but, but the, the outline of what happened here is that Bogosian uh, did a, uh, in, in 2018, published um, uh, sort of, it was a similar a little bit to, to some of the, some of the, uh, the sort of send up of, 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 acad of, of leftist academics in the, in the 90s uh, by, uh, by Alan Sokal and his colleagues. Um, Bogosian and a couple of his colleagues wrote some uh, faux academic papers that, that, you know, that, that they kind of put together as quote unquote nonsense. So, you know, it's, it's sort of word salad. Um, and they submitted those uh, to journals in fields like gender, race, queer, and fat studies. And some of them pass peer review and are published despite their ludicrous premises. Um, so it's very embarrassing, of course, for the, uh, you know, for the, for the editors and, and the journals in, in question. Um, and, um, and, and a, bunch of, you know, a bunch of people are kind of cheering this as an expose of how, of how corrupt the humanities are and how, you know, how, how it's sort of fake intellectualism and it lacks grounding. But, um, uh, but Portland State University's IRB, their Institutional Review Board, uh, actually looked into this and decided that Bogosian had committed violations of human subjects' rights and protection and is sanctioning him and saying that he can't, you know, for, for long, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe it's a 10 year ban or something. He can't do anything that involves human subjects uh, for, for 10 years because essentially he, uh, you know, that what they're saying is that he used human subjects for this expose, those human subjects being the editors of these, of these journals and that therefore uh, he, uh, he, has, uh, he has broken these ethics principles. Very polarizing. Um, I, you know, I, I'm tempted to do a little sort of show of hands of like who thinks this is, 
good, who thinks this is bad, I suspect that whether you would raise your hand to one or the other of those questions would have a great deal to do with which of those cultures you, uh, uh, you, you're rooted in, your, your academic background is in. Given that you've been studying Jupiter and Python and so on, I suspect I know uh, which, side, which side of this many of you would, would land on, although maybe not, because I think there are also generational issues at work here. So, um, so those, are, those are some of the pathologies. Um, and um, I'd like to now get into the really messy uh, part of, of, the, of the talk that, that hasn't been well prepared. I, I say hasn't been well prepared and use the passive voice. Notice that's a good trick. <laughs> so um, let's, let's talk about, about, um, about AI white papers now. AI white papers are sort of the, the artificial intelligence version of, of, um, uh, of neural ethics. Um, this is the first AI white paper that I can find. It's from the 60s. Uh, it's called The Triple Revolution, and um, it was penned by an ad hoc committee uh, that, uh, that included lots of really interesting people. Uh, so it was sent to, sent to Lyndon Johnson, to the, the, the president, uh, in, um, in 1964. Uh, along, with a, uh, along with a kind of cover letter. And the list of authors is quite impressive. It, in it includes computer pioneers and union leaders and philanthropists, the founder of the DSA, of the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, a couple of Nobel Prize winners in economics and chemistry, uh, an army brigadier general, union leader, um, Alice Mary Hilton, who was the academic who coined the term cyberculture in 1963, civil rights activists, Pretty interesting list of, of, of authors who put this thing together. And the claims in, in the Triple Revolution were that three things were happening that required us to rethink everything. One of them they called the Cybernation Revolution. That's a, that's a word that has not really withstood the test of time. But it's a portmanteau of cybernetics and automation. And what they meant was AI, basically. AI plus automation of supply chains. The second was the weaponry revolution. This was the era of mutually assured uh, destruction. This was, this was the, uh, the, the height of the Cold War. And it was the period when we had developed as societies, uh, hemispherically, the capability of annihilating uh, everything on Earth. And that seemed relevant. And the third was the human rights revolution. Uh, human rights was happening on the world stage. Civil rights was happening. And all of that involved a broadening of, of our consideration of, uh, and when I say our, right, this whole question of like, well, who is us? Who is, who is our? What is our? Right? A broadening of that to humanity and, and beyond, uh, as opposed to being all about, uh, you know, white English speaking educated men from, you know, certain fields and in certain disciplines. We're a very small minority, of course, who, um, who had been sort of firmly in the seat of colonial power in various ways. And, um, and all of those things felt like they were connected to, to, these, uh, to these authors. So, um, cybernation was, you know, new era of production, and um, uh, and and the the idea that, that that the means of production, if you want to use the Marxist phrase, were becoming more and more automated and moving into the, into machine phase as opposed to human phase. Weaponry, I've I've described, and the need, therefore, for a warless world, generally recognized, although achieving it will be a long and frustrating process. And of course, the human rights revolution. Uh, one of their conclusions, by the way, was that we needed a guaranteed minimum income guaranteed basic income. Uh, it's also, as far as I know, the first serious call for a UBI uh, that, that was made. So pretty interesting document and one that we should all know about and, and one that I, I think remains remarkably obscure today given, given everything, that, uh, everything that they went into. Uh, Martin Luther King, just days before his assassination in 1968, uh, references it, says, there can be no gainsaying of the fact that a great revolution is taking place in the world today. In a sense, it is a triple revolution. That is a technological revolution with the impact of automation and cybernation, he uses the term. Then there's a re re revolution in weaponry. Then there's a human rights revolution with the freedom explosion that is taking place all over the world. Yes, we do live in a period where changes are taking place. And there is still the voice crying through the vista of time saying, behold, I make all things new. Former things are passed away. He was, uh, he was killed just a, uh, just a few days later. Too soon? Yeah, in many ways, uh, 1964 was too soon. Um, you know, um, not that long before, in 1956, the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence, uh, you know, these you know, few, few guys got together and thought they could solve AI in a summer. Didn't happen. Um, but 
now we've actually achieved a lot of the Dartmouth group's goals. And um, so, you know, we look back at sort of what they were trying to do, what they were trying to figure out where we are now. Maybe it's no longer too soon to be thinking about these things seriously. Um, cybernation, well, uh, you know, <laughs> there, there, was a, there was this attempt called Project Cybersyn to, uh, to do uh, cybernetic automation in, um, in Chile. Uh, between 1971 and 1973, it involved these Star Trek-like chairs and this control room that would bring all of the information from the factories by telex, you know, to these dis to these kind of displays, and then like some dudes in the chairs, dudes presumably, would make the decisions about how to how to steer the country's uh, economy, and this could all be done cybernetically, and you know they'd be you know automating away more and more of their functions, not bringing a higher and higher level. That was um, brought to an abrupt end by uh, the CIA-backed coup in 1973 too soon maybe there, but now it's happening for real. Uh, rising gig economies, on-demand just-in-time services, um, goods, labor, markets, algorithmically controlled in real time with very fine granularity, that's Amazon. Uh, human labor, uh, training for machine data learned supplementation, Uber. Uh, resources virtualized and time shared, creating capitalist versions of the collective living that the Soviet constructivists imagined. That would be Limebike, WeWork, and so on and so forth. Maybe, maybe now it's time to think about this more seriously. Um, there, there's lots of great old constructivist Soviet stuff to look at if you want to know all about, uh, all about WeWork and about uh, you know, micro apartments and so on. Nothing's new. And uh, that's, of course, Amazon warehouses nowadays full of robots, uh, human exclusion zones. So yeah, cybernation is upon us. And as far as weaponry goes, um, you know, we're now having these conversations. How can international law regulate autonomous weapons? And we're now having them seriously. So, um, so yeah, a lot of those considerations you know, that, were, that, were, that were maybe a little bit sci-fi in, in 1964 are very much not sci-fi now. So, um, so this all seems like, uh, like progress. Sorry, I'm skipping the very, very text-heavy slides that are more my own notes. Um, human rights and civil rights and equality were also maybe a longer road than was imagined at the time, uh, as was, I guess, presaged by, by the assassination of King. Um, but with a lot of bumps along the way, maybe this kind of stuff is happening. Um, Peter Singer in 2012 said, 30 years ago I wrote a book called The Expanding Circle in which I asserted that historically the circle of beings to whom we extend moral consideration has widened, first from the tribe to the nation, then to the race or ethnic group, then to all human beings, and finally to non-human animals. That surely is moral progress. This is a point of view that's been echoed by, um, uh, by, by a lot of other thinkers as well. It's one that posits a progress narrative and is therefore open, uh, open to, of course, broadside critiques from humanists. But it's also hard to, uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard to not notice that, uh, that, that a lot of those conversations that are happening you know, in, in, that, uh, in that bottom row, a lot, of those, a lot of that discussion, that simply would not have been happening if we rewind the clock by, uh, by a few years. Those considerations of, of what it is like to, uh, to, to expand the circle of empathy and what, what that implies that we have to think about, those are, um, <laughs> you know, those are discussions that may be in academia or in the left we think are long overdue uh, or that we already had, we already figured this out many years ago and like why is everybody just waking up now? But they're conversations that everybody is having now and that everybody was not having just a few years ago. So, um, you know, it's an interesting moment along all of these axes. Globally, the world's in a much better situation uh, than it's been in the past, in past periods, despite the headlines on the war in Syria and other places where bad things are happening. There have been fewer people killed in wars or genocides or other forms of violence in the last decade or two than there have been in any other decade. We ought to take consolation in that. And I do think that what Singer uh, and Steven Pinker and others say about this is something that we have to think about. Um, one of the problems that we are encountering today in the West is uh, the problem of news and of social media and of the fact that, that those uh, processes of information transmission from person to person have become so fast and, uh, and so frictionless that the traditional gatekeepers of, uh, of, of news and of dissemination of information are falling away and, uh, and, and now news is subject to a kind of internal dynamics uh, that has been characterized as if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, right, and, and there are many ways of looking at that, but, but basically if something produces outrage uh, or is upsetting uh, or uh, is saddening, that's going to propagate faster 
and wider than uh, you know, a good news story. And as a result, I feel like a lot of us are, are, are very pessimistic these days and feel very dark about things, uh, especially young people. And um, you know, it's, not like, it's not like there's nothing to freak out about. Um, the thing we really should be freaking out about, of course, is, is ecological. Uh, if we shit the nest, like we don't have another planet to go to. So um, you know, we, we have a major, major challenge ahead of us uh, with respect to reversing a lot of what we have been doing uh, to the planet. But you know, life is pretty good right now. We have the space, we have the, we have the opportunity to, to take a lot of these actions right now in ways that, um, that, that are inconceivable if we go back even a few decades. We have, the, we have the intellectual tools, the technological tools, the breadth of participation in, in a technical economy um, that is absolutely unprecedented. We have everything we need, and yet we're all dark, we're all depressed, uh, we're all paralyzed. Right, by, by the way, by the way um, you know, all of this sort of, sort of negative news travels quickly, despite objectively the fact that, that we, are, we are living in, in the best times that we've ever lived in. And um, <laughs> you know, that, that in itself is a major problem. So um, you know, it, I think this might be a good moment. Uh, I, I'd like, to, I'd like to, to open for discussion soon, but before I do that, I'd like to, I'd like to shift to maybe the punchline, which is, thinking about this question of good and bad from a, a broader perspective than, uh, than I think that we have tended to do uh, in the West. And, and this is a perspective that, uh, that, that might be of real practical use when we think about, about AI ethics and neuroethics problems. So. Give me a second. Actually, let's skip straight to here. This is a, a table, or a part of a table, that, um, that some colleagues and I have been working on, thinking about, uh, for, uh, for some time now. And it's part of a harms framework. And the reason that we think a lot about harms frameworks is because when we talk about problems like machine learning fairness uh, or neuroethics, um, there's always a polarity that we have to consider. There is a, you know, doing good, doing bad. And if you think about it, there has to be a subject to whom the good or the bad is being done. We don't think too much about subjects because uh, it tends to be the case in Western countries that, you know, because of the, of the medical roots of this entire ethical field, the subject is always the individual. But even in the Belmont report, the subject was not only the individual, it was also things like you know, the, fact that, the fact that everybody in the Tuskegee experiment was black and that that mattered. Right? So identities that are larger than just a single human were part of the original consideration. But if we think about all of the entities that can be benefited or harmed, and maybe harm is an easier lens to think about this through, there are many of them, and they span a lot of different orders of magnitude. So this is an attempt to sort of rank a few of those in, in terms of their scale, roughly, um, starting with a human individual or a non-human organism or an artifact. Can an artifact be harmed? Sure, of course an artifact can be harmed. Right? Um, to families, neighborhoods, physical communities, online communities, a reproductive lineage, that's the kind of harm that we have to think about if we, if we talk about, about uh, some of what can be done with CRISPR, for example. Um, to organizations, corporations, political parties, media organizations, interests, affinity groups, NGOs, worldviews or norms, they can be harmed too. One of the great innovations of humans and one of the things that, that, that genuinely distinguishes us from uh, all of the other intelligent animals on Earth, of which there are quite a few, is our ability to organize ourselves via abstractions. And what I mean by that is that even if you look at the other social primates and the other uh, animals with big brains, the elephants, the, the dolphins, uh, the, the chimpanzees, the bonobos, they, they all are limited in terms of the scale at which they can organize by um, essentially familiarity with individuals. So, you know, social unit consists of uh, you know, me knowing and other people. And that's one of the reasons why we have the Dunbar effect, which is um, 
the, the scaling of troop size uh, as a function of cortical area. Basically, if you don't have a mental model for all of the people in your troop, the troop will fall apart. We don't have that as humans. We've exceeded that. And we've exceeded that in relatively recent memory. And the exceeding of that corresponds precisely with the explosion in technology. Uh, as hunter-gatherer tribes, um, we can't do things like this auditorium or these slides or the computer uh, or the Bill of Rights or, or what have you. That requires organizing at scales that are much larger. It requires organizing at scales that involve not, not having a personal relationship with everybody else that you're organizing with. Uh, if I'm a military commander and I you know, take charge of a, of, of, a, of a unit in the army, I can assume a certain norm, a certain standard of behavior, a certain way of, of interacting and so on without building relationships with everybody that, I, that I've just taken on. And that is extraordinary, right? The fact that we're able to culturally build and transmit uh, those kinds of meta structures, of meta social structures. The same with corporations. Uh, the fact that we have these uh, fictive persons in our laws that allow us to hold companies to account for things, uh, in addition to holding people to account for things, that's fundamental. If you're not able to do that, then uh, you know, or, or have some equivalent, some equivalent structure, then you're not able to organize people to do something bigger than themselves and at the same time hold that bigger thing to account. So, you know, worldviews. I mean, when people talk about harm being done to democracy, harm being done to the rule of law, harm being done to the justice system, uh, harm being done to um, America's reputation abroad, those are harms to ideas. And people feel those things viscerally, right? They're, they're real. Uh, that's, that, those things have real consequences in terms of social organization. They have real consequences uh, in, terms of, in terms of what can be achieved by societies down the line. But it's not just you know, a person being injured. It is something more abstract being injured. Uh, landscapes can be injured. Institutions can be injured. Tribes, nations can be injured. Future generations can be injured. Languages, cultures can be injured. Ethnic, racial, cultural, class, gender, sexual identities can be injured. Ecosystems can be injured. International alliances can be injured. And of course, the planet can be injured. And so in many ways, when we think about, about ethics frameworks, we have to understand that each of these parties, each of these kinds of party is an entity and has a point of view, if you want to think about it that way. Is it a point of view that is unified, that's unitary? No, of course not. Just as it isn't for an individual person. We have all kinds of conflicts inside ourselves. There are you know, a lot of reasons to believe if you're kind of a subscriber of Marvin Minsky's kind of society of mind sorts of ideas that you know, our ideas about our holism are, are actually kind of problematic as well, that we also have all kinds of you know, internal agents that are kind of duking it out all the time. But um, you know, it's, it's kind of fractally the case that all of this is about uh, pyramids and networks of agency. And all of those different agents have some kind of an emotional system that, that understands uh, from its own point of view good and bad. And so when you're performing an action, you have to be thinking about all of the other agents and all the other scales at which that action is, that that action is going to uh, interact with and what their good or bad polarities are. Model those things. Does that mean that there is an absolute truth about what those are? No, it's a model. And these things are models all the way down. Your model of good and bad for yourself is also a model. Uh, you know, if you, um, I, I mean, not to, not to bring this to a weird place, but like uh, even something straightforward, like whether, you know, whether pain is injury is not a simple question. The whole BDSM community is about exploring the boundaries of that exact question, uh, right? So consent, context, everything else matters. And we model ourselves just as we model others. So, uh, you know, if you, if you have in mind the idea that good and bad are something that is kind of handed down or that has some kind of objective reality from the outside, it, that's, that's not a model that works. It's, very, it's trivial to break it. It's, it can be broken in all sorts of ways. And any, any kind of utilitarian approach to ethics, by the way, uh, is, is, is going to run straight into this problem. So it's models, and those models are relational. They exist you know, in, in relation of something to something, even if that's you to yourself. 
And when you do something, you have to be thinking about what entity you're acting as, what the polarities are for you, what the polarities are of everything that you're interacting with, and try and muddle through and try and be clear about what you're prioritizing when you prioritize, because invariably, there are going to be situations in which different parties have different interests. Basically, it's always politics. There is no way of avoiding politics when you talk about, about ethics, because there are always many entities at work, and there are always different, different, um, uh, different orientations to all of those different entities. And the moment you get beyond two or three, then you're necessarily in a situation of, of conflict and of mediating conflict. So um, I, I know I've been nattering on for, for 50 minutes. I think this is probably a good moment to, to stop and, and, and maybe, do we have a little bit of time, uh, Ariel, for, for, for discussion or, or Q&A? Yeah. Unless I put you all to sleep. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Well, the, the, idea, the idea that you connect your efforts with a larger thing uh, and that, um, and that you, you, know, you ally yourself, you put your shoulder to the wheel, um, that cannot go along with the idea that you blindly believe that that larger thing is right with respect to all of its, you know, uh, or, you know that, that your model for it, right, is one that is just entirely rosy. I mean, that can't be. Right? The moment that entity is complex, then there are many forces pulling in various directions. So, um, you know, and that's true at the individual scale as well. Like the idea that, that you know, that, that you are virtuous and you never do anything bad and so on is, is nonsense, right? Everybody does things that are, that are counter to someone's interest at various times or counter to certain norms or, or what have you. So, you know, I, I think we have, to, we have to dispense with the idea of purity. You know, it's just not, it's just literally not possible. And anybody who claims that they're, you know, pure and, and, and good and everything is, you know, everything is, is in accordance with some kind of an abstract ethical norm, I just, I just think bullshit. Like, let's look more closely, if that's the case. Let's look at what you're trying to project and, and what that in turn is all about. You know, what is that projection all about? So, you know, should you be thoughtful about who you work for, what, what wheel you put your shoulder to, why you're doing it? You know, how you're putting your, your shoulder at the wheel, of course, you have to be thoughtful about all of those things and you have to do it with your eyes open. Um, and you have to prioritize. You have to think about what, what matters. Um, I went to Google because, uh, you know, it felt to me like if, you know, if, if I succeeded in doing some of these things with federated learning and privacy and on device, you know, AI and so on, A, you know, doing that at Google would really matter in a way that doing it at Microsoft, which you know, it had become clear had lost the cell phone race, et cetera, wouldn't matter. So even if Microsoft had been more you know, ideologically pure or whatever, which you know, it isn't, but let's pretend, right? It wouldn't, I mean, my, my inclination would have been to go and not to stay because I, I care a lot more about getting this thing done than, than about, about whether the thing that I, that I'm, uh, the, the wheel that I'm putting my shoulder to you know, is, is pure and perfect in every other way. Um, so, is that a is that a reasonable? Yeah. Thanks so much. This is all really important. Um, my question is a little bit about. So, you talked about the triple revolution white right? paper. Yeah. That this kind of thing came about. You mentioned that there have been some more recent. There have been a few white papers actually. Yes. Yes. A flood. A flood of them. There's like white paper FOMO. <laughs> so one one paper I wanted to ask you about is that the recent white paper. Uh, from OpenAI, yes. which was the uh, AGI white paper, where basically, uh, for those who read it, the idea was, you know, let's create a white paper on how we can ethically achieve artificial general intelligence yes. um, as a community. And, you know, thinking about sort of Sam's question about you know, there are all these conflicting interests, there's quite a bit happening, um, there are many commercial interests in this space. Yes. Are from your insight, where you're sitting, do you think people are able to kind of wrestle with the neural ethical issues AGI is bringing up 
in the way this white paper is outlined, do you see any concerns there? Or is there anything you're really hoping to see people consider that the there, yeah, for sure. Um, I, 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 yeah, I have, a, I have way too much to say about that than, than I could possibly fit, even, even if I blathered on for the, the remaining five minutes. Um, I, I think that I think that there are good intentions behind behind a lot of those white papers. Um, I don't think that they're all just uh, just virtue signaling. Um, which, of course, we also do. And if you think about that in terms of that harms framework, you know, virtue signaling is also an important part of what happens right, in interactions between entities. But, um, uh, but these, there are more than that. There are, there are, there are very good intentions there. Um, but I think that there are a couple of things that are missing from, uh, from, uh, from a lot of those white papers and from a lot of the discussion. And one of them is, is the consideration of, um, of, of these larger structures. And, uh, and of, of what we mean by general intelligence, anyway. Um, intelligence is, I believe, fundamentally social. And I say that as an introvert and a person who doesn't actually like, like people that much. <laughs> but um, it's, it's social in, in the sense that, that it's the social animals that have it. And they've undergone that thing that we call an intelligence explosion through the modeling of each other. Uh, in other words, it's not like ethics is something that is tacked on at the end. And you say, oh, like, yeah, we figured out intelligence, but, you know, but let's put some guardrails on certain things. You know, I, I think it's actually the other way around, that the ethics, ethics is actually at the, at the you know, fundamental to the way intelligence arise, arises in the first place. And in many ways, what we have to be figuring out are ecological questions about how, how, to, how to generate intelligence, as opposed to just thinking about um, performance on a test, which is the way most... Uh, AI works nowadays. It's like, well, here's you know, there's the data set, and we get state of the art performance. You know, on the, on the data set. Like, do you think that if the state of the art performance increases by another 0.3%, it's going to wake up and say hello? Of course not. Right. So that's not a route to AGI, uh, despite the fact that we achieve superhuman performance at one after the other of these of, of these uh, of these tests. Another big gap, and one that I think is very important. I haven't talked about China today, but this is also uh, I think a massively important conversation to have. They have an alternative uh, take on, uh, on AI and also on social organization and also on values, um, which uh, leaves a lot of Westerners terrified. When we look at what is happening with, uh, uh, with the social credit system, which has been very widely reported, but also, uh, and I think maybe more importantly, the securitization of Xinjiang, uh, which involves a very, a, a, a absolutely devastating oppression of the Uyghur minority through total surveillance. Uh, through uh, systems that will make it impossible for that community to ever do anything Arab Spring-like and organize, because literally that organization, both in, in, uh, you know, on the internet and in person, is impossible uh, with, with, that, with that level of control. It makes anything the Stasi did in East Germany look uh, technologically lame, right? which it is relative to what we can do now. Um, but the thing that, we, that, that I think we, we, we neglect when we only take that point of view about China, is the fact that Confucian values uh, favor a lot of entities that are larger than the individual human. And they look at things like social cohesion and harmony. And, uh, and they, look at, they look at network scale effects as primary rather than as secondary, the, the way we do with our obsession with the individual. So you know, they also don't have the, the, uh, uh, you know, the problems of spiraling uh, um, uh, self-doubt and pessimism and, and uh, fake news, unless it's state-generated, <laughs> uh, that we do. They don't have the, uh, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of that kind of spasming of the social network that, that we're encountering as such a giant problem in the West because we've been focused entirely on individual values. So is there a synthesis wherein we think about multiple of those scales in the system together, about harms occurring not only to people but also to larger structures that can bring some of, uh, some of that Confucian stuff in as well? I think we have to do that, or else we are going to be, um, or else we're going to spiral. Like, I think we literally have created a global scale brain that is having epilepsy right now, because we're not thinking about the larger structure at all. So, um, you know, it'd be nice if we could find something in the middle. And I don't mean half surveillance, right? I mean thinking about both scales of entity. Um, yes? So, as a former president of the humanities and philosophy, <laughs> Um, I was kind of intrigued by your characterization of humanities, and you also cited Peter Singer. Yes. So it seems that you would acknowledge that there are like actual, you know, 
I don't know worthwhile is the right word, but sort of authoritative. There are, there are a lot of worthwhile humanists, and, and the course that I gave at UW is full of, you know, of critical theory and of texts from a lot of these people, yes. So then my thought was just, maybe the people who are hiring ethicists are just bad at hiring ethicists. Um, That's, that may be true. <laughs> that may be true. I, 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 do, think, I do think that, there, that there, is a, uh, there is a hole in, um, in Maybe you could call it ethical praxis, um, right? So it's it's not that that all, that those thoughts are all worthless, right? Or that or that those books and papers are not worth reading. Uh, I think the problem is more that um, that there is a there is a missing muscle of how to actually do practice, how to get your hands dirty in in some of those fields. That that you know we need to develop something in the middle, right? So it's a, it's a little bit like the China and U.S. question. I feel like there are two there are two fairly extreme camps. One of which is uh, you know does not question does not criticize, is illiterate, right? I mean, computer scientists and people who do a lot of the practical stuff are, are literally illiterate about a lot, of the, a lot of the humanism and a lot of the thinking that has happened in these, in these areas, and I think that's a huge problem. I also think it's a huge problem that humanists have been on the outside of things for so long and doing critique from a distance that they, um, that they have, in many cases, lost the, um, the touch, right, for being able to, to really engage in the problems that they're wrestling with intellectually at a practical level, 